that was the first time like working as an adult, like working, you know, big bang job, whatever. And it was my opportunity to show like, hey, like we're going to change this business because because in retrospect, I wanted to take the business I was working for to the next level. Like that's all I wanted to do is like, let's make more money. I know if I make this business more money, I'm going to get paid more money. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. And for today's episode, we have Alex Evans, the owner and CEO of The Raging Agency, a restaurant marketing agency. I always get excited when I have a unique niche or a unique kind of area of business. I have not had anybody on the show that has anything to do with restaurants. So that's really exciting. Yeah, it's, and thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, just before we started, I was telling him that like you made me feel super comfortable walking in first podcast so i'm really excited to kind of like get into the details and like do a little bit of storytelling but um it's so funny because everybody honestly tells me this all the time like restaurants that's such an incredibly hard niche it's it's a, it's a tight niche it's really interesting that you're working in it but to me like i tried absolutely everything else when it came to marketing and it was like no i have to go back to like kind of like what i know so i think that we'll probably tap into that yeah no we're definitely going to go into why you picked restaurants how you got to that and everything before it uh so thank you again for coming on the show and thank you for letting me be the first person that interviews you on camera Hell yeah. i'm always excited when i have a, a fresh podcaster in the other seat um i will promise i'm going to make the conversation as easy going and as conversational as possible and like i had mentioned before i like to keep the conversation kind of in chronological order to give the guests and people we have listening um, just a view on your life. So going through some of the stuff that we had talked about prior, you started as an orphan in Russia. Yeah. What was that experience or what can you remember from that experience? Dude, it's a, it's a really tough experience, obviously, but I think that it's a really important one. And honestly, I think when I was growing up, so the I guess I should address this. This is probably the biggest question that everybody asks, like, how much do I remember of it? And like, were my parents open and honest about, open and honest about me being adopted? And the tr so the two answers there is no, I don't really remember being an orphan. Obviously, I was pretty young when I was adopted. And one of my best friends is also adopted. And he doesn't remember anything. And he was like, he was even like, uh, older than I was when I was adopted. So I think even if I could remember it, I probably wouldn't. Yeah. So I don't. And then the other question, like, uh, did I know? Yeah, my parents actually hyped it up in a way that made it feel like a holiday. And I can remember as young as being like, maybe like three years old. I remember I was going to school and we would like celebrate it at school, like as a class, almost like it was my birthday. And I think that is absolutely like the coolest thing ever. Um, and still when it's like my anniversary of being adopted, like my parents will like text me and be like, happy gotcha day is what they called it. So <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. They made it really, really cool for the circumstances, but I do think that being adopted, um, hardwires you to be like different for sure. I think there's like an inherent amount of struggle as a kid. And then like, I ha obviously had to like work through that trauma. And, but I think that it gives me a lot of drive to today, to be honest. Yeah, and you mentioned that your best friend is also adopted. Was yeah. that just out of complete coincidence? I mean, I don't really believe in coincidences, so I think it was probably fate. Um, but I do think it's quite interesting that we both have a similar story. Obviously, both coming from both coming from Russia as well, and we also both like look alike, which is kind of weird. Have you checked to see if maybe you're like actually related? No, we haven't checked, but uh, I have done like the ancestry test and okay. everything like that, so I kind of know the history, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So when you were adopted, was were you adopted by a U.S. family? And is that how you made it over here to the United States? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's how, how I made it to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was like raised in the suburbs of uh, Milwaukee, which is interesting, too, because I knew a couple of kids like who also were adopted. But when I was like super, super young, I don't know them anymore. Like This is like pre-K, basically. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I think it's kind of weird because... All the statistics from at least the kids that I did know then, like, didn't really, like, pan out so well. So I feel, like, really blessed, and I feel like I had an amazing family. Uh, obviously, it was really cool that they, like, celebrated the day that they did adopt me, which, yeah. That's it, was like, it was like a second birthday, honestly. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And, like, let's be honest. I mean, that's a testament to you, too. Like, I mean, they got you at a young age and raised you. For them to continue to have been so excited and honor that, I mean, that definitely means you were a good kid. You weren't you weren't that much of a pain in the ass. I think I was a big pain in the ass, but I think they loved it. <laughs> That's awesome. So 
you made it to the U.S., you're in Milwaukee. When did entrepreneurship or business start to be something that was interesting to you? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously coming into the podcast, I knew that you're going to ask me that. And I think I've been asked that as well in the past. It's really hard for me to pinpoint exactly when, but I have a very specific story that happened in middle school that I think kind of reminds me. I remember some kid who didn't want to walk to middle school, but I would bike there. And I had like charged him five bucks and he hopped on the pegs of my bike and I like drove him there. And I just remember like that story was obviously very weird, but also at the same time, I was like, why was I even thinking of that? Like, why was I scheming that young? Like, and I thought that I think as, as far back as I can remember, I've always really been into entrepreneurship, but definitely I think in middle school is really when I started to take it seriously and try and figure out ways that I could start making revenue. That's awesome that you have that story. I know I've had a lot of people and I ask that question to everybody because it's all different. Some people never thought about it till it smacked them in the face. Some people were thinking about it in second grade and wanting mm-hmm. to make money. So it's awesome that you have that vivid memory of you basically making your first transaction. Yeah, You're selling a service. And in the moment, you probably didn't think twice about it. But now looking back, it's like, man, that was a pretty savvy move. Yeah, looking back, I think it's quite funny (laughs) yeah right you should have just camped out on that corner there every week and try to see how many kids you could take to school yeah exactly man i should have (laughs) that's hilarious so when did you take your first real stab at business when was your first leap of faith into like okay i'm gonna try and use my time and make it into money yeah the big one was uh I, i was still in high school i remember i was trying drop shipping I don't remember exactly what the product was, but I I remember like creating a Shopify store, doing research on like which product I should do. And of course it like totally flopped, but I absolutely loved doing every aspect of the business, right? Like creating the logos, creating the website, uh, creating the messaging behind it, doing the product research, like everything about that got me so excited. Like that feeling of like when you just don't need to go to bed because you're so yeah. amped up and you're like, I can't go to bed right now because I got to figure out the next step because I want to put it all together. And I remember that was like that feeling. Um, and that, and I didn't give up either, to be honest. Like maybe like I failed on the first product or f- or 10 or 15 <laughs> or whatever. But I remember by the time I got to college, I think like maybe going into freshman year, I had a product on Shopify that was making money um, through like trial and error with one of my good friends, Ronnie. And it was like one of the best feelings ever. And I think that that started to give me the confidence of like, hey, actually, I can make money not only like, you know, the way that I want to, but also online. Like, I don't need to physically go into a job. Yeah. And that that realization for so many people is just the most insane. Like when I accepted my first dollar online from a complete stranger, complete stranger, I was like, holy shit. Like, this is amazing. Like the possibilities (laughs) are endless now. Exactly. And and that that's amazing that like and that's a very popular way to get into it. So many people try drop shipping. Yeah. And like we talked about before we were on camera, we're only one year apart. So like the trends that we both experienced in high school, college were very similar. Yeah. And I remember everybody thought drop shipping. I knew you would go on Twitter or X now or Instagram and see somebody driving around in a Lamborghini and they would say it's because they drop ship yeah. like a toothpaste or something. Is crazy. that what Ty Lopez did? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm actually like one of the only people that doesn't know that much about Ty Lopez and like didn't consume his content. It feels like a sin. Like, yeah. cause like everybody that sits in that chair is like, well, yeah, Ty Lopez was somebody who inspired me. Yeah. Now. He's kind of goat. I can't believe yeah. I'm saying that, but I mean, he did really change the space, honestly. And like, you know, he had a knack for getting in front of people, obviously like the garage videos and like the book videos were like pretty, pretty crazy. And were you a big Ty Lopez fan when you were starting up? I don't think I ever watched like his videos. I just saw his ads all the time. And to to an extent, I was like, you can't hate him because he's literally in front of my screen. I can't get rid of him. He's doing a good job. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that that, he's doing a great job. (laughs) I have a few of those, like even guests I've had on the show. Man, you guys are flooding my Instagram feed with your ads. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I do that now. (laughs) Now I'm probably going to get you now I'm probably going to get you all over my Instagram. Dude, the funny thing is it works. Like we'll have consultation calls with people or we'll do like one off like like uh yeah, consulting or something like that. And then within a matter of weeks I see them start coming back into the funnel. It's like I don't I don't know. It's kind of crazy how the ads work, but 
Instagram must just be doing a really good job at like retargeting the people that you're talking to. Because for me, like every time I post that I had them on the show or I post a picture with them post show, start to get their ads yeah. after the fact. Well, we'll see, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll, yeah. Th- we'll do an experiment here. Let's see. If after we post about this show, I start just getting tons yeah, of your ads, know. I'll be like, okay, shit, you should tell everybody to just post with you because it's going to retarget them. Oh, yeah. I would love that. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so you kind of settled on this agency. Marketing was what was starting to pique your interest. Yeah. Is that something that you learned in college that started to come and get you interested or was marketing when you were drop shipping one of your favorite parts of the product that's a great question i looking back the drop shipping stuff was so long ago i think that that was what got me excited about drop shipping was learning everything because i didn't know anything yeah. about business before then yeah sure i know how to sell like a ride to school but that's obviously very different than like t- selling products creating websites all this kind of stuff so the way that i see drop shipping was it was literally just my first time having my own business putting my own money into the business too, losing money as well, trying to run out, like trying to do everything. Um, and that's just got me really excited for the future, I think. But um, to circle back to your question, like how did I end up on the agency model? I was straight up forced into it, which is like the craziest thing ever. Uh, Cause I kind of had it handed to me in one way, but I was so ambitious and so young and so eager to hustle in another way that like, that's kind of how I got forced into it. So I can tell you that story, yeah, actually. Let's, yeah, let's hear it. So I was working for Surge Restaurant Group, which is a, a pretty pretty great restaurant group in the state of Wisconsin. They're still in business today. They own um, and operate, I think, the, the nicest steakhouse in the entire state, which is uh, Carnivore. Uh-huh. So I was working for them as a marketing director. Well, actually, even if I rewind before then, it was just working as a photographer. And then that photographer role kind of like segued into social media because I was like, hey, like your current social people, like they're not doing a good job. They're not, you know, they're just sharing a photo, crappy caption. That's not going to cut it. That's not actually going to convert into business. Yeah. So they were like, well, what do you think? Like, should we get a new person? Or is this something that you think that you can take on? I was like, I don't know if I can take this on, but I will. Like, I need to do this. Like, because yeah. it couldn't be any worse. It was like simply couldn't be any worse. So I gave that a shot and then it worked out really well. The other person ended up getting fired. So unfortunate, yeah, yeah, unfortunate, but I was hey, like, it's uh, what is it? Um, damn it, I'm trying to think of that quote here. I'm derailing you. No, that's all good. It's the, it's the quote of like life. This is like one of the most basic quotes so that basically the the lower level animal will always get eaten. Oh, sure, natural selection. Yeah, it's natural it was selection. natural selection. Yeah, natural selection. It was exactly yeah. that. And I felt, but it amped me up, bro. It gave yeah. me so much energy. Of course, I didn't want to see the person get fired, but the that was the first time, like, working as an adult, like, working, you know, big paying job, whatever, and it was my opportunity to show, like, hey, like, we're going to change this business because, because in retrospect, I wanted to take the business I was working for to the next level. Like, that's yeah. all I wanted to do is, like, let's make more money. I know if I make this business more money, I'm going to get paid more money. So she was gone. And then we like kept going from there. And then I was like, you know, I think we're kind of maxed out on organic right now. And like, it's just funny looking back because I, you know, barely even knew social media. But I was like, let's get ads into the play. They're like, do you know how to run ads? I'm like, no, but I will learn. So while I was going to school, then like after school, I would watch hours and hours and hours on how to run Facebook ads. And like, honestly, I got pretty freaking good at it. And like, where were you finding the content? on how to run these ads was it all youtube it was all youtube like when it came to ads it was specifically youtube because in my business classes at school we weren't talking about how to do that we were talking about how to structure business and like how to actually create you know the messaging and you know find our time and you know just all business kind of stuff yeah. but i needed to like figure out how to run ads like tonight so so yeah we just i would create ads on a very minimal budget and then you know they kind of would work you know it was, it was a super simple setup at first because you know, I was running the nightclub, like division, basically, and m- most of our ads were just for like events. So we just wanted to get people to respond to events. But then, like moving forward, then we started running ads at like different locations that they also had. I remember like in New Year's Eve was obviously one of their biggest times, uh, obviously for like a nightclub. And they instead of selling tickets for like thirty five, forty five, fifty five bucks, I was like, let's sell these tickets for one fifty, two hundred bucks. So like, well, we've never done that before, and I was like, well. I feel pretty confident because we have advertising on our side now. Like we already have a really great 
brand established. You guys were, they were doing well before I joined, Yeah. but I was like, let's command more pricing. And like, just like following the guidance that I was, you know, kind of putting out there and also feeling really confident in my skill set in advertising, learning literally directly from YouTube and then just trial and error. Yeah, they had their best, they had their best New Year's Eve ever. I wow. Getting a pretty fat bonus after that. It's hell yeah. Yeah. And that was, was that like a really pivotal moment for you? Like you kind of put yourself on the line there, made a, a big suggestion to a company that was already successful. It's not like they had everything, they had nothing to lose, like a company that's not succeeding. They kind of have everything to lose. They raised the price because you suggested it and it goes bad. It's all on you. Yeah. How was that when things went well? To be fair, I don't know if I was really thinking that way when I was younger. I was so ambitious and just so driven, still am obviously, but I felt like so deeply rooted in the fact that they need to be making these decisions. Like like I said, like it is it is a reflection on how the company is doing, especially if I'm going to become like the marketing director there, which ultimately I did become. It's like, how can I make these suggestions? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'd never put my back to the wall, I guess. Like I was always pretty firm in like what needed to happen. And from my point of view, like there was a lot of oversight. So yeah, it was a big company, but also at the same time, like the bigger the company, like the more eyeballs are kind of on things, the slower everything goes. And I feel like, especially in like hospitality, you kind of need that spark. You actually need like real genuine confidence to come in the door and say, you guys are doing great, but I know that there's like a better way we can get, we can make some more money here. So I feel like that's kind of like the role I came into. And of course, like leaders are so important too. They kind of allowed me to feel comfortable to make those recommendations as well. That's amazing. And that that's very fortunate because not a lot of places, not a lot of companies are that open to having somebody younger earlier in career make big decisions like that. And I know it's something I've struggled with in corporate America and other people I know have struggled with. Us younger people, like we have all of this access to the internet. Yeah. We actually know a lot more than people give us credit for. And at big companies, when you are trying to innovate and trying to bring ideas to the table, sometimes it doesn't always make your upper management look good if they're not the ones that suggested it. Mm -hmm. So you were fortunate in that moment to have an upper management team that believed in you and was going to ride with you good or yeah. not, which is really awesome. I think it's that Italian family lifeline that they were, that they had like that. I don't know. They really, you know, they appreciated me, but I completely agree. And like, it's tough. I've never worked in like true corporate America like that. So I couldn't imagine what it feels like to be stifled like that. Yeah, and some of these companies with 30, 40, 50,000 employees. Yeah, like, that's tough. You might think that you're super smart, and you might have a great suggestion that's like really needle moving for that company. Yeah. But chances are it's not going to make it that far up the food chain. And if it does, you're probably not going to get the credit for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's cool that you had that experience. Yeah, they not only like welcomed my suggestions, but they doubled down on it, which is ultimately like why I mentioned that I was like, forced into like the agency model in many ways like forced into business because i was getting a lot of rec uh like recognition inside of the company for being a great marketer but then like my direct lead uh donato shout out him <laughs> changed my life but uh directly from him he would always tell me he's like you are a fantastic marketer but you're not a great marketer you'll never be a great marketer until you understand business and he forced me to learn business so I worked with him for two more years after that, like almost one on one, just like this. I felt like we were always together, almost like he's my brother at this point in time. He taught me literally everything about business because to be a great marketer, you really need to understand like how the business is actually operating, how it's built, who's in charge, what happens when those people aren't in charge or, you know, what happens when people don't show up or, you know, there's just yeah. so many minute details to a business, especially one that's like a brick and mortar where people are like coming into it. I, I just remember learning lesson after lesson after lesson. I remember like screwing things up. I remember not understanding so much. Like we were having these conversations and I just fit, like I couldn't comprehend or I wouldn't get it, but that's okay. Like it's business is complicated. Yep. So I learned like so much through that and like ultimately um, putting together like the marketing and then the business side really took me to the next level. And, and so the way that I actually ultimately started like an agency I say it was like pushed into it because he kind of like made me learn business as well. So I could like basically operate my own business. Uh, people were coming to the club and then they would ask to speak with me because they wanted to know who was actually like behind the scenes running the show. So just by off of that, I got my first like, like a handful of clients. That's amazing. 
And in that two year period where you're learning business, what was your biggest takeaway? If you can go back and remember that time. Leadership, 100% leadership communication. A good CEO is a master of communication. That's something I'm trying to work on absolutely every single day. Uh, but I remember there, there'd be multiple times, obviously like running marketing in a nightclub sounds crazy enough. And it was, but I also remember like if you add alcohol to the, the environment, to the situations, just the batshit crazy things I would see all the time. And I remember one time kind of throwing the flag in a little bit, not giving up, but like, I remember at this point in time, I'd been working at the club for over three, three and a half years. And I felt like I could handle anything. I felt like I'd seen everything especially when you throw alcohol into the mix, I still felt like I know exactly what's going on here. And I remember one time a girl, one of the VIP servers, like coming into the office, bawling with her dog or something is so random. And I just remember not knowing how to take care of the situation. Like it was so unrelated to work and it was so personal and it was so, but it was just so bizarre. But also at the same time, like as a leader, as somebody who's literally running the company, I need to be able to handle any type of situation, literally any type of situation, even if it's not work related. So I remember like radioing him over the walkie talkie and him coming in. And I remember just like watching a master at work. He changed this girl's life within like four or five minutes, just talking and like such a calm demeanor and like listening, truly, truly listening. And then like kind of sending her on her way. Like I felt like the entire world changed. Like he literally just connected with an individual so deeply and like, I, I think I'll never forget that, honestly, because that's like how I try and like lead my business now. Yeah. And leadership is probably the most important part of running a successful company. People say culture that comes from leadership. Yeah. And the fact that you were able to have a mentor in that pivotal time in your life that you were able to watch one on one, like so many people that sit in that seat and talk usually had somebody that passed the torch yeah. or showed them the ropes. So it's awesome that you had that really amazing experience and that story there is like embedded into you that you can recite over and over again of what you wanted to be when you became a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely, yeah, it was absolutely crazy. I can't thank him enough, honestly. So now you're being forced to go run your own business, quote unquote forced. When do you finally take the leap of faith and leave the club and go open up your own shop? I was forced out again. <laughs> COVID, baby. I mean... COVID came around and I remember I just ran. It's so it's such a funny story because I remember the day before we were shut down, uh, like the like the world shut down, like we weren't necessarily shut down. But I remember, I think it was like March 14th, 2021. And the reason I know that is because the DJ who was playing that night, who was from New York, I just ran into him in the sidewalk a week ago here in Miami. Wow. And he said, do you remember March like 14th, 2021 when the world, it was our last night. And like the world shut down the next day. And I was like, dude, that's crazy. That you remember that. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I was out of a job at that point in time. Yes, I could have stuck around and like just worked for their like restaurants. But I mean, the trajectory of the world was like not really in the favor. So I took a big, 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 big leap. And I just packed up all my stuff in my apartment. I, put, I drove it back to my parents' house and I stayed there. And I thought about what I really wanted to do with my life. I stayed there for about a month. And I remember like going to bed. And just being like, feeling so mediocre and just being like, life was so great, but also moving forward, I don't really want to be in a nightclub environment anyways. Like, this is the perfect time for me to pivot into something new. What do I do? And at this point in time, I probably had like three, four, five, maybe clients, uh, all that had like kind of known me like locally in the city from word of mouth. And I remember I did like probably one of the craziest things I think I could have. I just like, one night, bought a plane ticket to Mexico and dipped. And I <laughs> just left. I just left, man. I, you know, I had full intention of still like honoring the work I was going to do for my clients. But by this time, I was accepting payments online. I like when I first started business, I was doing checks. So I like switched over to accepting money online. You know, we had retainers in place. I was feeling really confident and comfortable with the workload I had. So I just dipped. I went to Cosmo for like about a month or a couple of weeks or so. Uh, and I thought, you know, let me do a test round. Can I be a digital nomad and like actually do this? So I went to Cosmo and I chilled and I stayed at like a nice, like a uh, hotel kind of vibe, uh, like a mix between like a hotel and a hostel. Yeah. So there was other people there. I was still social. And I remember like chilling by the pool, swimming in the ocean, renting a moped and like 
just enjoying the day. So like every single day I enjoyed it. And it was, it was uh winter in Wisconsin. So I was like missing out on the snow and I just felt like, yeah, I can do this, man. And I had like, yeah, we didn't lose a client at all. Like it was great. Wow. And, and how did it feel to take that leap of faith in that moment thinking like, well, if you go over there and you're locked in for a month and all your clients cancel on yeah. you at week one, what are you going to do? Dude, there's still a part of me that gets a little spooked out about like losing clients. Like if I travel, I travel all the time now and because of it was such a great experience. But that is a scary thought. And I don't really know where that stems from, to be honest. And did, do you, so you say you still travel. So do you still practice the digital nomad life? And what has your experience been doing that? Uh, so I don't like fully practice it, but I'm actually for the first time since back then, I'm going to go back into like another season of it. And uh, so I'm going to leave Miami for the summertime and just travel during the summertime. The problem with like traveling though, for a CEO and a businessman is that it's so much easier to conduct business when you're in one central location, especially when you're in America, you can get anything that you need delivered to you instantaneously. I know where everything is. I go to the same grocery store here, right? Like life is significantly easier yeah. when you're on the road. Everything takes more time. Turnaround times are harder. Your cell service might not be as good. Like there's a laundry list of things that could go wrong, but um, I wouldn't regret going back. Like, Cozumel was really just the start of my travels. From there, I went to like 20 more countries. Oh, so yeah, no, I was really doing it. And then the problem with that that I found was like, it was really hard to scale the company. So, you know, ultimately came to the point where I was like, you know, I really want to grow this business. Like we've been doing really well, but we haven't really been growing. We're just kind of maintaining and plateauing. So it's time for me to pack it up. So ultimately, instead of going back to Wisconsin, I chose South Florida. Uh, it just seemed like the place to be. Not a bad place. To be. Not a bad place. <laughs> so, when did the agency take that big step? So you said it was doing well. You're able to move around, travel, but I, I, I might have read it wrong. I've seen the agency was doing over a hundred thousand dollars a month in recurring revenue. Like that's really successful. When was that time? When did that happen? What was that big jump? Okay, so to clarify, it wasn't doing it wasn't doing six figures in revenue. Um, it's technically still isn't. But like the new, like where we're going now is we're going to be scaling the current offer that we have at our agency to six figures, like guaranteed. Like Okay. Yeah. Got it. So, got yeah. it. But did you have a moment in building the agency where you took like the, you saw significant growth? Like you came back to scale it. And, yeah. And it was, what was that moment? Yeah, for sure. So um, we had, a, we've always had really good referral. So like we never used to run ads. We do now, but we didn't in the past. We would just ask our current clients to kind of like extend out like invitations and interests to other companies. That always worked out pretty well, but there was a big pivotal moment. It was actually the same month I moved to South Florida. So originally I actually moved to Fort Lauderdale before I decided I wanted to come to Miami. The same month I moved into uh, Fort Lauderdale, we had some like cash stacked up and I went to all of my clients, like prepared to lose them for some reason, a little freaked out. Because also they don't even know where I am. Like they don't really have like a pulse on kind of like where I'm traveling, whatever. And I remember I like repitched every single package to every single client. And they all were like, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And it, it, it was like this, the most weird moment ever. But it, clearly I was undercharging and clearly they liked the service a lot. So I was able to like double the business literally overnight. That's awesome one. It was you were sick. able to, to to have that moment and it's it's interesting like you were nervous, you were mm -hmm. scared. Think about how many entrepreneurs are in the same seat as you and don't do it and just say, "Hey, I, I don't want to I don't want to ruin anything. Like things are pretty good as they are right now." What would you say to the entrepreneur that's on the more scared side, not on your side? Specifically to raise the rates or just like to go do something that they're scared more, mm -hmm. not even sure. on the exact thing like most entrepreneurs, you get faced with moments where it's scary and there's pivotal moments where you either do it or you don't do it. And yeah. what would you say to that person? So something that I tell myself is the more that I do, the more I'm able to do, but this, that basically resonates and like transfers over to the more action that you take, the more opportunities that you get. So if you're just able to like ask more people things or pitch more ideas, you're going to get more feedback. Ultimately, you're going to have more opportunities. That's really good advice, actually. And 
the more data, the better, because then yeah. you can make decisions. You can be make with, better decisions. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So like, for example, when I was repitching all the packages, I started with somebody who I knew I was like ready. Like if they left, whatever, it doesn't really matter. So I started with them. Oh, feedback's good. Okay, cool. And then just kind of work up the ladder to, and then like, yeah, basically like save all the big like clients for the last. Cause yeah. I want to know exactly how that conversation is going to go, what questions they might come up with. Uh, yeah. Dude, that's even a small detail that for you is a really smart decision as an operator CEO of like, before I get up to the big fish, let me just get as much information as possible. Yeah. So by the time there, it's like, it's like the back of your hand. It's easy. You already know the objections. Cause I think that's one of the interesting things about sales and maybe it's not for every industry, but when you sell into one industry, the objections are typically pretty common. Mm -hmm. Like everybody yeah. has the same problems. Yeah. Everybody asks the same <laughs> questions. Everybody doesn't know kind of the same things. So as a salesperson, you begin to notice and understand those things. So it's like second nature. You could put yourself in front of 15 different clients in one day. Yeah, they're all going to say the same one to three different things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it, so, wasn't, it wasn't always like that for me, though. We never niched down into restaurants until like somewhat recently. Actually, last year in 2023. So why did you niche down just to restaurants? I joined a mentorship program in 2023 and they were all about just sticking to one thing because how are you going to run ads for an agency if you're just trying to do everything or just like service everybody? It's just easier. It's more cost effective to narrow it down into one niche, which is like a really honestly great way of looking at it because if for another agency owner out there who's not niche down yet, it's just at the end of the day, it's more expensive. Like you need to tailor your message, right? So they, they wanted me to pick one. I picked like roofing or something, some bullshit. And I, and then I was go, doing all these sales calls, doing these intro calls. And I realized, I was like, what am I doing? I don't know anything about roofing. Like when I have these conversations with people, I'm like, I literally don't know anything about this. Why did I pick this? And I thought about, you know, I thought in depth. I was like, why did I pick it? Because I thought it was going to be easy. Well, why wouldn't I just pick something that I actually do think yeah. is easy? So yeah, I had the conversation. I was like, well, I've been working in restaurants since I was like 15. It was like my first job. I worked in different types of restaurants and bars, just doing everything. I feel like I have a really good pulse on like hospitality, food and beverage. Obviously being a marketing director, like didn't, didn't hurt like whatsoever. So I, I called my VP one day. I was like kind of out of the blue. And this is after like 300 intro calls for roofing, like it's 300 conversations. I still don't know the business, which is kind of stupid on my part but I called her and I was like what if I did something or what if we pivoted to like actually what I know and she's like like food and I was like yeah <laughs> she's like yeah I mean like yeah I think everything would probably be a lot better despite everybody saying like oh restaurants don't have margins or oh like it's so tricky like oh they don't have money and I was like but that's ultimately what I know and like we at this point in time we'd already had a couple of restaurant clients and they were doing fine they were paying us on time they're actually some of our biggest paying clients at the time. So that's ultimately why we made the switch. When you made that switch and started to niche down, other than the cost saving aspect of it, what were some of the highlights of just going all in on one thing? Your life gets significantly easier for a couple of different reasons. You're pitching to the same like archetype day in, day out. So like I generally do know like what their lifestyle is like and like kind of what their problems are. I'm able to sell a package to them now, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. Um, and then the third part being is that we have, well, it's a, it's an extension of like having the package, but now like in our, like our CRMs and our setups, everything is like tailored specifically to restaurants. So everything has a particular place. And if we don't fill out things, then I'm like, oh, we're actually missing this. But if you're just serving everybody, you don't really know exactly what you need. Yeah, so it allows you to, really tailor what you're doing and make things seamless yeah, it's, and yeah. not all over the place. Yeah. That's awesome. Yes. We, we had to make it scalable. Yeah. That's right. And, yeah. and that's a simple answer. It's just not scalable when yeah. you're all over the place. Yeah. Niche down and then you can find a clear path to scale. Yeah. yeah. So going through some of your content on social media, a cool one that I saw was Dunkin Donuts. How did that come about? Yeah. So one of the largest like franchise owners of Dunkin in Chicago called us up kind of out of the blue. And it's a really cool way that it actually worked. It wasn't like so far out of the blue, but I'd actually met the guy in Miami. And to be honest, we weren't, we weren't talking business at all. He had heard that I worked with restaurants. Um, 
But I, I don't know. I thought Duncan is huge. Like, there's yeah. no way I'm going to work with him. I never pressed anything up against him. I never even, like, told him the services or anything. Like, he was, if anything, asking me and then gave me a call, like, six months later after meeting him. Like, we just genuinely had a good time hanging out in Miami. That was it. And was it, I mean, you don't believe in coincidences. I don't. Was it sure. just, was it completely random or fate that you met in Miami? Or was there a mutual connection? There was a mutual connection between us. Um, but even before I actually met him in person, I had no idea that he even owned so many Dunkins. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't think that like a corporate company like that, even if they do franchisee would be open to an agency service like that. I, I didn't know they were responsible as yeah, the owners. Spoiler. They weren't, they weren't very responsive. They like uh, corporate called me directly and they were just like, Hey, we need to, you know, we need, we need to find out more about this basically. Like, and you, yeah, so, see what exactly what the relationship is. So he had to go and get approval from yeah. corporate. Yeah, ultimately, yes. And did that work out, and was it fine? No. No, it was not. <laughs> it was not fine. Okay. No, so, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't fine at all. I, I could, in a way, I covered his his ass. He didn't do his due, due diligence, but at the same time, we, it was cool because we we filmed all the we filmed all the ads. We created like the entire marketing concept for them. We launched everything too, and it's still rad. It wasn't until a couple of weeks in, maybe probably like a month in, where they were like, hey, we actually need to go through like this whole system. Um, and I, I felt like we both actually felt like at the same time, this probably isn't worth it. And they own a bunch of other different concepts as well. So we just kind of like moved our plans over to their other concepts. So okay. in a way it worked. But, yeah, it worked yeah. out eventually. But yeah, it was, it was interesting because like when you go through your videos, the two Duncan videos are the ones yeah, that they got blew like, so up. much attention. They blew up. Um, so that's why it caught my attention. Yeah. Um, what's like a cool story that you have of working with some of these brands? I know you're doing that cool thing with Syndicate now. Yeah. Um, what's like a cool story you've had with a brand? Cool story with a brand. Well, we have two really cool case studies. We took one restaurant that literally sells cheesesteaks from like 50000 in monthly revenue up to 236 in 17 months. Is that a local shop? That was, yeah, back in Milwaukee, actually. Oh, I got to go over there because I'm a huge cheesesteak really? guy. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sick. Okay. So, yeah, that was a really cool case study. And that's actually what we, like, built our entire, like, system off. Like, our entire offer is based off two two different case studies right now. One's about the cheesesteak place. And then another one is about Mad Chicken, which you might know. It's this I know, Matt. It was right by Hollywood. It was literally yeah. right by where I was going to buy that house. Yeah. So the owner of Mad Chicken came to the club when I was like 22 or whatever and was like, who's running this nightclub? I've never seen a club. And this guy travels, bro, like around the world. He's like, I've never seen a club this busy by like 10 p.m. in my entire life in any like continent of the world. And then so the security guard was like, you got to talk to this kid. He's like a wizard. So I talked to him. We hit it off instantaneously. So I took Mad Chicken from one location, and they're at six, 26 right now. We're going to open like two or three more in the next couple of weeks. And what did you do for Mad Chicken to get them to that? Like, what is the behind the scenes that you did to get them to be able to be that successful? Yeah, I mean, pr pretty straightforward. We were running their social media pages. We were taking content for them. We were running all of their ads for them. We would work with, like, local media, press, influencers, uh, just to get the word out re realistically because they would open up locations. I remember when we first opened one here in Florida, it was in like Pompano. No, it was Hollywood. Hollywood was the first one, which was pretty serendipitous because it was around the same time that I'd moved here actually, maybe a couple months afterwards. So it was cool to see a brand that I'm working with helping scale was like also scaling with me too. Yeah. Well, I kind of like aligned in that, in that same sense. But uh, yeah, big, big part of his ads. And I learned the ads of the club and I was like so young and like I was learning off the club's budget and everything and like YouTube University felt like everything was kind of like coming together. And in my mind, that's like an award winning ad setup that we have that we we still use to this day. Why are ads so hard? Like, why is it so complicated for business owners? Is it just something people don't want to spend time learning or is it really that complicated? I think it's pr pretty complicated, to be fair, because every time I feel like we have it completely solved, we don't. It's like literally every time I'm like, Oh, this is gonna work for the for that guy, for this guy, whatever, for this next restaurant. And then it's like you do it and it doesn't work. So you really gotta like yeah, troubleshoot, troubleshoot, test. Yeah, I, I, I remember I, I flirted with ads for a little bit, just just kinda effing around and yeah. I did not have a good time. I had one that like a random lead magnet for an old uh Discord group that I had 
where I spent like 60 bucks and I got 400 emails. It was like amazing. There you go. That's and then incredible. I, and then I paused it because I was like, holy shit, yeah. what's going on? Yeah, and then I started it. again and it didn't work. Like oh. nothing happened. So I'm like, oh my God, like what if I would have just let it run? Like maybe it would have been the reason the business blew up and I kind of, I just, I don't know. Maybe. But so ads are finicky like that yeah yeah it's crazy and i'm that was one of like maybe 15 times i tried and the yeah. rest of them were all just done like yeah. nothing cool happened <laughs> no, i get it I, I get it we at one point in time so like the 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 normal model for when you're scaling an agency is when you're really really small obviously you service them yourself when you get a little bit bigger you get a little bit of cash then you start outsourcing to di like different teams so you have like a ad buyer team or whatever seo team so we kind of did that a little bit but then I realized it was like, they cannot replicate what we're doing in our own internal ads. So I had to like fire those teams and bring everything back in house. So are you completely in house now? Not a hundred percent, but like pretty, pretty close to it. We don't do a lot of the website projects, like okay. the development. Um, but yeah, everything else, like I've had to like retrain everybody on how to do the ads, client communication, everything like that. And how is that? Cause I know there's oh, probably, I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs here listening that probably outsource a lot of yeah. what they have going on what it what what would be your the, advice to them the hot take is don't outsource anything like if you can't or it it has to make sense i think for like development purposes it really does make sense it's just so much more cost effective to go overseas but depending on what services you're doing if you're able to do the service yourself and i am like i can do almost anything that i would task one of my employees to do that means that i can create an sop and i can train them so ultimately like we have full control that's something you really don't want to give up. Like the longer I'm in the game, especially I think that's the difference between agencies that'll sink or swim. The ones that do really, really well have things in house. The ones that are just floating by and have like horrible retention probably outsource. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that just makes sense. Like you're more committed to the product when you have yeah. your hands and everything. And obviously like there is delegation, but it's it's internal. It's not just yeah. some random yeah. agency that you're on your fourth or fifth lead gen agency and your fourth or fifth ads agency. So yeah. keeping things in house. Yeah. That's good advice. If something goes on with a client, it, they're literally like a call or a text delay and then everything can be resolved basically the same day. And I don't really see that in a lot of agencies ever, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I haven't had the best time working with agencies in my life. Sometimes oh. it's tough. Yeah. Cause I mean, well, one, I, I probably was, skimping out and trying to find the cheapest or mid-tier one and yeah. i got mid-tier results well, bro there's a, yeah agencies are a dime a dozen and there's like thousands of thousands them. Of like them. hard to filter through in your industry though is there that many agencies or have you kind of created a little bit of this like semi-untapped niche look like the information that we know probably couldn't be replicated by many agencies we're super familiar with our competition, our, our, comp our competition. One of our biggest competitors here in Miami. And I don't know if I was being naive, but I just like DM them, like the owners, like there's two of them. I DM the, the owners on Instagram and I was like, hey, I, I live in Miami too. Let's like get lunch. And they like blocked me. Oh. And I was like, okay, cool. So this is like, you're actually nervous. You're sweating. I didn't mean for it to be like that. Yeah. But I'm like happy that it's like that, I guess. And uh, so we're really tapped in on what our competition is doing. I think that that's just like the first thing that you should do when you're doing business or one of the first things is to like understand what the market actually looks like. Um, but to an extent, yeah, I feel like we're providing an exceptional service. Our retention is really, really good. I don't think anything like that's ever going to change. I don't think we scale as fast as some other people, but I think that just comes with time. Interesting. Two questions here. First one is... If there's a restaurant owner, somebody connected to a restaurant that's listening right now, what qualifications do they need to have to work with you? What 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 does that look like? What does working yeah. with you look like from their perspective? So our ideal target is a client who is probably doing around $75,000 a month and has like four locations. So like 75 at each or between like 50 to 100 at each because we already, I already know like I'm getting, ooh. I already know we can fix everything. So we could take them from like four locations to 20 and probably double their monthly revenue. So like that's like the best case scenario. Um, but we launched a new offer not super long ago. And that's 500 new customers in 60 days. And I think we're just over like three and a half months of having that offer. 
and everything is going so well. Awesome. And I'm just like loving, yeah, I'm loving like every minute of it. And like today I got a text message from a place. And this is what made me think of it is because I remember being on a sales call and the place was really small. It was like a restaurant attached to a gas station. They were doing like $36,000 a month in monthly revenue, which is great, especially for a place attached to a gas yeah. station. But it was like in a small town. And I was like, I really genuinely don't know if I'm going to be able to help them. So I told them like, we can give it a shot. Like we'll still do everything that we do for everybody else for you. But like, I can't necessarily guarantee 500 new people. You're in a really, really small town. And I texted him today just to check in and like see how everything's going. Uh, we're just coming up on our three months now. And he said to me that everything has been like absolutely crazy. And he's like, I've actually been meaning to text you, but I've been so busy hiring more people to work here that I literally have not had the chance to talk to you yet. And I was wow. like, hell yeah. That's let's amazing. Go. So I was like, yeah, that was really cool. If we could do, if we can get good results for a place in the middle of nowhere, like, yeah, I yeah. feel really, really good. Okay, question number two, and this one is, is more a comedic question. My brother and my cousin, he's like a brother to me, we're the same age. They're amazing chefs. Like, they cook the most amazing foods and they love it. How realistic is starting a food truck in Miami? And, like, would do you work with food trucks? Like, if we wanted to say, F it, we're starting a food truck, could we use your services and blow it up? <laughs> <laughs> What kind of food do they make? They really they the majority of the food they like to do is steak based food. Oh, awesome! That sounds good. Like steak and chili. Like, yeah, like all different types yeah. of steak and like smoked meats, like mostly in the the meat category. I will say yes. So, do we work with food trucks? I mean, realistically, it comes down to if they can like afford yeah. the services. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, we do work with a couple of restaurants that have food trucks in addition to the to the restaurant which is before i got started and like food like like totally niche down i had no idea that restaurants like will also buy a food truck which is pretty smart on their yeah. part um but yeah florida doesn't have like the like south florida doesn't have like the best barbecue and stuff to be fair yeah so if there was like a really good barbecue place especially like a food truck i think it would stand out okay maybe maybe yeah. maybe i'll convince all of us to quit our jobs and go all in on a barbecue food truck Maybe you should, and that will certainly help you. But, like, you got to remember, too, like, we're all emotional beings. We all eat every single day. So if you can get how – if you can, like, tr transform and capture how amazing your brother's food is on camera and get that out in front of people, like, they will certainly wait in the line for you. That's a very powerful statement there. It's true. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. As we get to the end of the conversation, I always ask the same question to my guests at the end here. And the question is, looking back 10 years from now, what needs to happen for you to think that you succeeded? Looking back 10 years from today? Like, we're 10 years forward. 10 we're years looking forward. back till oh, now. Oh, 10 years forward. Okay. What, do, what needs to happen in these next 10 years for you to say, I succeeded? I think this answer is going to piss a lot of the people off that I go to the gym with. A lot of the same guys that I go to the gym with, uh, you've had on your show before. And realistically, and this also ties into a social media post I've been seeing that's going like mega viral right now. And the post is all about how when you're in your 20s, like there is no balance. So you should probably just accept that. But the thing that if I'm, if I would be, so I'm 26 right now. So if I'm 36, looking back, over these upcoming 10 years, the true indicator of like, if I'm living a successful life is if I'm actually enjoying most of it. So like I try and instill the 80, 20 rule, but into like happiness and obviously happiness is a fleeting thing, but like maybe fulfillment is more in line with the word I should be choosing. But if I can go to bed at night and not feel like I want to rip my hair out and like if, I, if I'm happy and I know that I'm working with people I love and like I'm actually enjoying the day and I'm taking time to be athletic and go be in the sun and everything like that. Like if 80% of the next 10 years looks like that, bro, that's a huge win for me. That's a huge win for anybody. That's a huge win. Or it yeah. should be a huge win it for should everybody. be, yeah. Dude, that's awesome. And, and, and thank you so much for sharing like this whole conversation here. The last thing I'll, I'll give you the chance to say is I've had 
hospitality people on. Obviously, your restaurant, you got very niche down. For the people watching that might be interested in taking a stab at the hospitality industry, what would you tell them? You have to know your shit or it's not going to work out. Like, I don't want to come off too pretentious by saying that. But realistically, I've worked almost every single position inside of a restaurant and I've done almost everything that you possibly can for digital marketing. It's just a recipe for success, pun intended. I actually like know, I like know what's going on and then like, yeah, kind of know the trends and everything. So it's totally cool. Like if you want to get into it, you absolutely should just make sure that you know what's going on or I just don't think it'll be enjoyable. So to sum that up, you're saying go try a lot of these roles, like Go be a bar back, go be a server, go work in the back of house and see how things operate. Yeah. And that's for any business. If you want to be a business owner, period, you have to try like everything about the business. You got to really understand it or you're going to end up like me, like taking roofing calls and not knowing what's going on. Yeah. It's not very favorable. Yeah, for sure. So where can people follow you? Where can people get in touch with you? Um, I want anybody who listened that might want to connect with you to be able to reach out and maybe potentially work with you or just make a connection and maybe use you as a mentor as they try and get into the industry. Yeah, I would love to. I, I do some mentors right now. I only work with people like I genuinely like love and like want to see them win and everything like that. But if you feel like that's you, you can find me on Instagram at Alex Evans 997. That's actually the username for like everything. But Instagram is definitely the preferred way. And then if you're a business, you can either... Uh, send us a message directly to my personal Instagram. That'll be me who responds. Otherwise, you can go to ragingagency.com. Awesome. And all of that will be linked in the description below, the link to the agency, the link to your social media. So for the people that aren't that lazy, just click the description, go click on it and reach out. Um, Even if you just enjoyed the episode, let him know. So brother, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, bro. And thank you for sharing this. Podcast number one in the books. Podcast number one in the books, Beyond the Wealth. Thank you so much, man. Cool. Thanks, brother.